Okay, so I think we'll um, get started. There may be a few people joining us, some latecomers, but I think they'll come in the door at the back there, so hopefully they won't disrupt things too much at the front. Um, it's great to see so many people here. Um, hopefully you'll find something um, in this talk that, that will be of interest to you. And I know we're starting um, just a few minutes late, but I'll still try to make sure that there's time at the end in case you have questions about anything that I say. And to be honest, if there's anything that occurs to you, you know, while I'm talking, do, do put your hand up. I mean, I'm going to try and keep things moving forward fairly swiftly, so I'll, but I'll, I'll try to see whether any hands are going up. And, and so if you do have questions, you know, I think that's important. Um, the topic for this talk is obviously quite a broad one, um, artificial intelligence and social change. Um, and as I'll explain in a minute, I'm, I'm not really going to try and talk about that in its totality because I think we'd be here at least a decade. Um, but I'm, I'm going to be um, selective and look at some particular kind of case studies, really. Before I get on to that, let me just say something about the sort of research group based here in Cambridge that, that's involved with the kind of research that I'm, that I'm going to be talking about today. So this, this work really all comes under the auspices of a project called Giving Voice to Digital Democracies. And the, um, the subtitle, if you like, of the project is The Social Impact of Artificially Intelligent Communications Technology. And I'll say a bit more about that in a second. You can see this kind of rogues gallery of, of, of key players here. And you've got some details there. I'm not going to go through them all exhaustively, but you can read a little bit um, about where some of my, my colleagues are based. As, as you can see, it's a mixture of people that have interests in um, technology and have actually been involved in developing um, different forms of artificial intelligence, in some cases going back to the 1980s. Um, personally, I've been involved in developing AI systems since the mid-90s. Um, but we've also got people who are very much on the arts and humanities side who, who look at these things from a sort of linguistic perspective or from a sociological perspective. And the whole idea of this project really is to bring together these different groups both within Cambridge and, and elsewhere um, to try and, I suppose, improve the nature of the, the, the discussion about these kinds of technologies. We also um, work with people in government, um, advising them when they're developing policy in relation to these technologies. And we also have connections with various you know, big corporations, the kind of key players in this, in this sort of field. So that's really where, where the, the sort of things that I'm talking about today are, are coming from. So let me start by saying something about artificial intelligence. Well, I think it's fair to say that those of us involved in developing AI pretty much universally hate the phrase AI, you know, artificial intelligence. It, it's, it's got a lot of baggage. It's been around a while. It's a kind of sexy term that people still like using. Um, the only time when I use it myself is when I'm giving a big public talk because it appeals to people um, or if I'm designing a poster for something. Um, but I don't really think of myself as someone who develops AI. And again, I'll, I'll say more about that in a second. But if we start with this, since, as I say, it's a phrase that's used, it's, you know, newspapers love this phrase, and, and artificial intelligence is, is very popular at the moment. It, it, it's, it's, through its long history, it has periods when it's very trendy, and then it, then it goes into a sort of trough, and then it's trendy again. And at the moment, it's very trendy. Um, if you go to that source of all truth, Wikipedia, and if you look at its definition of artificial intelligence, this is what you get at the moment, <coughs> or at least it was a few days ago. Um, in computer science, artificial intelligence, AI, sometimes called machine intelligence, is intelligence demonstrated by machines. It's deep, isn't it? It's deep. <laughs> in contrast to the natural intelligence displayed by humans. There's all sorts of problems with a definition like this. I mean, what is intelligence? This is something that philosophers have been discussing and debating, well, certainly throughout the 20th century and, and, and earlier, if you're, if you're happy to accept, accept that slightly different words and phrases were referring to something like intelligence in earlier um, centuries. Um, but nonetheless, despite all the vagaries about what exactly artificial intelligence is, a lot of people have very strong opinions about it. I've got some quotations there. Again, I'm not going to go through them exhaustively, but people like Elon Musk, who again is, is you know, very, very successful at getting his opinions um, <laughs> broadcasted and attended to. You know, he thinks that, that AI basically will destroy the human race. Um, Stephen Hawking became very interested in this um, in the years um, just before his, his death. Um, he thought it could be amazing. He thought it could be horrific. It, it, it depends. Um, and then more recently, you know, people have said that these technologies are going to be essential 
um, to, to pretty much every aspect of, of what we do as, as modern digital democracies and societies in the future. So there, there's a wide range of opinions. Um, for someone like me, someone who actually develops AI systems, one of the reasons why I struggle to, to, to think of the world in terms of AI is that the phrase suggests some sort of homogeneity. It suggests that there, there, there are various tasks and, and there are similar sorts of algorithms and bits of software and, 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 and um, mathematical models that, that you can use. When actually in reality, AI is this extremely complex ecosystem, if you like, of very different approaches, some of which will work extremely well for certain problems and they don't work at all for other problems. And therefore, to talk about this huge heterogeneous totality as if it's some sort of homogeneous thing seems to me problematical and it often simplifies the discussion around AI in a very um, un unhelpful way, I would say. I've given you just a couple of examples, though. You don't need to worry about these in detail, but y you, know, you may remember that a few years ago, um, an AI system <coughs> that played the game Go um, reached a point where it could beat uh, you know, humans who, 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 who were the <coughs> best people in the world at, at playing this particular game. Um, and it used this technique called reinforcement learning. Well, Go, like any other game of that kind, has a finite set of rules. It's like chess or something. You know, this particular piece can be moved in this particular way, and it's entirely rule-based. So it's very easy to set that up so that the system plays against itself at, at, at huge speeds. Um, and so it can learn strategy by playing against itself. Um, that technique doesn't work for something like machine translation. You know, what's the finite set of rules for translating from Mandarin into English? I mean, I've never seen them. If, if, if you've got a set of rules, let me know. You know, we'll get very rich very quickly if, if you have them. Um, but those sorts of tasks are far too complicated. So these techniques that work in one domain don't work at all in another domain. And as I say, that's what gives this whole vague area of AI, this great sort of heterogeneity. So those of us focused on this project that I mentioned at the start, um, we're interested in not talking about AI as such, but if you like, a subset of all the things that might possibly be classified as AI. And really, we're interested in language-based AI. And I'll say a bit more about why we, we, we're focused on that in a second. But one of the things I'm going to be talking about um, a fair bit um, as I look at the next few slides is what's given at the bottom here. So artificially intelligent communications technology. That's really what I'm talking about when I talk about language-based AI. So these, if you like, are... are intelligent systems, whatever that means, that in some way make use of language. Okay, and I'll give you some examples. So I've said something about artificial intelligence. Um, the other cluster of, of products and strategies and approaches that often gets referred to is information and communications technology. Um, and that includes everything from social media to you know, the phones that we actually use to access these sorts of things. So again, I'm assuming that you know, these are things that are already becoming um, perhaps quite regular parts of your, of your daily life. And these are also technologies that people have quite strong views about. Um, so around the time of national elections, there are concerns that these technologies create echo chambers. You know, we only interact with people on Facebook who agree with us, and then we're absolutely shocked if there's some sort of political event that, that goes in a sort of contrary direction. You know, how could that possibly have happened? Everyone I interact with was, was viewing it in a different way. Well, that's the kind of echo chamber effect. Um, there are concerns about the impact these technologies are having on mental health, and that's something that's receiving um, increasing attention. And then someone like George Soros, who again I think is, is a sort of pretty prominent figure, um, you know, he, he argues that these um, companies, these prominent social media companies, um, deceive their users by manipulating their attention um, in order to direct it towards those companies' own commercial ends. And it's certainly no secret that um, some of the features that one encounters on something like Facebook and other, and other sort of forms of social media um, are designed purposefully in order to be addictive. Um, the more time you spend looking at your phone, using a particular app, or looking at a particular social media feed, um, the more money that potentially generates for that company. So it's, it's, it's in the corporation's interest, really, to um, inculcate an addiction on your part towards the technology that you're using. Um, and I think it's fair to say that that's, that's something that's worth reflecting upon. That's clearly having some kind of social impact, and it's something that we should 
at least think about, even if we conclude that it's a wonderful thing. So if you take artificial intelligence, whatever that is, and if you take um, these information and communication technologies, and if you put them together, there's an intersection. So we've got AI, we've got information communications technology, and in the middle, we've got communications-based technologies that involve language in one way or another. Um, so these are, these, are, these are artificially intelligent technologies that you, you interact with using either written language or spoken language. So here we've got an example of um, machine translation being used. So here you've got a sign held up in one language, and it's, it appears in, in, in the phone um, as a result of this app translated into another language, although everything else about the image remains the same. Um, Siri, I'll say a bit more about those sorts of things. Again, I think these virtual personal assistants are becoming more and more um, common in our daily lives. And then things like um, Amazon Echo, these smart speakers you know, that, we, that we give instructions to and they give us bits of information and play music for us and all of that. These are all, if you like, sort of prototypical examples of these artificially intelligent communications technologies. And again, just to summarize what I've said really, these systems all involve things like um, different forms of speech technology, so speech recognition. You know, I speak into a microphone like this and, and, and it comes up on the screen as text in real time. Or speech synthesis, I type a text and it's um, converted into a human-like um, voice and, and, and it's spoken by the system. Machine translation, well, an automated system that you know, translates from French to English or whatever. And then dialogue systems, which is pretty much what Siri and Cortana and Alexa are. These are systems that we can sort of have some kind of conversation with. And then there are also techniques that are often clustered together under natural language processing. So natural language understanding or natu natural language generation, document summarization, these sorts of things. And as I say, the, these sorts of virtual personal assistants make use of all of these technologies. That's why they're sort of prototypical examples of that. And I think it's fair to say that in really the last few years, you know, since things like Siri and Cortana have, have started to be used more extensively, um, there have been a wide range of concerns expressed about these technologies, or at least uncertainties, even if they haven't developed sufficiently far to be um, explicit concerns yet. There are uncertainties around them that people feel uncomfortable about. Um, here's just one example. So, okay, you know, smartphones, they're a very useful thing. I mean, we've all na navigated our way through an unknown city, unknown to us, using, using a phone, and it can be very helpful, and all sorts of other applications. But in terms of when we should start using these technologies, you know, should there be some sort of age restriction on this? You know, should children be forbidden from using some sort of smartphone until they're, what, 10 or 12 or 15 or 16? Um, what should the age limit be? And should there be an age limit? Um, and even if they're able to gain access to a phone at a relatively early stage in their lives, what should they be able to access using it? What sort of restrictions should be placed on their usage? And who should decide? Is this something that the government decides? Is this something that there should be, I don't know, some kind of independent body that, that gives advice about this? And just earlier this year, the UK's um, chief medical officers um, published a document that did indeed give specific <coughs> advice about children's screen time and social media use. Um, and that received a fair, a fair amount of attention in February. But that's just one example. That's just one example of a potential problem. Um, let's look at another one. So state-of-the-art machine translation systems, and again, think of Google Translate, but there are plenty of others, um, are notorious for producing outputs that are, that are usually classified as being sexist. And what that usually means is that when they have to deal with things like pronouns, um, they normally opt for the masculine default. So if in doubt, just go for the masculine pronoun. Um, even in situations where it's absolutely clear to any, any human who, who's familiar with, with either of the languages involved um, that the gender of the pronoun is, is, is fully determined by the context. So this is a Google Translate example on your left side. Um, you've got the English example, <coughs> the women started the meeting, full stop, they worked efficiently. And when that's translated into French, the first part's kind of okay, you get les femmes. Um, but the second sentence begins with il, I-L-S, which is the masculine plural um, subject pronoun in French. Now, you try and explore why this happens, and, and there, there are several sort of explanations for this. 
Um, the main explanation is that if you look at the training data that these systems are built on, and if you just look at the pronouns that are used, 70% um, of the time masculine pronouns appear, um, and therefore 30% of the time you get, you get feminine pronouns. Now for a language like French, that partly arises because the masculine pronouns are still used generically. So if you're just talking about an indefinite group of people and you don't know whether they're men or women, the default is to use E. Um, but of course that's something that there's, there, there, there's some controversy about. Um, and certain um, linguists in France are, are recommending that, that that traditional practice should be discontinued and there should be neuter forms that are, that, are, that are introduced to avoid that kind of bias in, in the, um, you know, in, within the society itself. And if there is that sort of skewing in the language that we use on a regular basis when we're talking to each other or, or when we're writing things, then these AI systems will simply learn and reproduce those biases. Um, so you might look at this and say, well, Google Translate is being sexist, but perhaps a, a more accurate way of thinking about it is, no, the society that produced the data that Google Translate is trained on has these tendencies, you know, it's skewed in these ways. So Google Translate is just very faithfully reflecting back to us um, skewings, if you like, that characterize um, the way we speak and interact on a regular basis within the societies that we, that we, um, that we you know, live and work in. But the problem is that if these technologies simply reflect back to us our own prejudices, preconceptions, and, and skewed tendencies, um, they potentially um, obstruct rather than <coughs> facilitate any kind of social progress. Right? They, they keep us kind of trapped with what we've got rather than enabling us to perhaps move forward and, and, and um, you know, improve <laughs> the sorts of societies that we, that we um, are associated with. Let me just give you another example. I mean, there are many examples that I could look at. Um, this is just another example of automated, artificially intelligent communications technologies that are, in a sense, neutral in and of themselves, but can be used by societies in ways that are potentially harmful or potentially beneficial. It depends what your view is on all of this. So again, another form of these technologies that gets quite a lot of attention are Twitter bots. Right? So these are bits of software that can autonomously, so it doesn't need a human being to kind of press send or whatever, they just autonomously, autonomously send tweets or they retweet things, they like things, they follow things or they unfollow things, and they send direct messages to, to other accounts owned by you know, human users. And increasingly these are being used to try and influence public opinion um, to spread either information or misinformation, um, and they, they certainly seem to be um, used quite extensively in issues that polarize public opinion. Um, so again, I'm not expecting you to be able to see this, this here, but it's from an, an article that was published, I think, last year um, that looked at the role of Twitter bots in the last um, American election um, and tried to determine the, the extent of the influence they had in, in, in guiding um, thinking about the, the people who were, who were standing for election. The one in the middle, this is something that was in the news just a couple of weeks ago. Um, so this is from Boris Johnson's um, Twitter feed. And you might not be able to read these, but, but these are just all messages that, that pretty much all say, support Boris 100%, support Boris 100%, or 100% support Boris, right? Now, it's possible that, that hundreds of people around the country were sitting there typing exactly the same message <coughs> at pretty much the same time. It seems much more likely that this is a, a kind of Twitter bot <laughs> initiative and that these things are just sending out these messages to try and, and through this kind of drip, drip, drip effect, convey that message. So when you look at those examples, you might think, well, okay, these technologies are damaging, are potentially harmful, um, you know, manipulating public opinion, perhaps in sort of mischievous ways. Um, but then you also have the recent phenomenon of therapy bots. I don't know if you know about these, but this is basically the same technology. But rather than being used to influence, say, public opinion or political opinions, um, they're used for, for what you might classify as positive social purposes, such as trying to improve someone's um, mental health or, or, their, or their sense of well-being. So there's one that receives a fair amount of attention um, called Wobot. See what they did there? Um, this has been around since 2017. And it, it basically encourages self-care. So it interacts with you um, 
as a therapist of a certain kind might interact with you or a counselor of a certain kind. So the little dialogue here, if you can't read it, says, um, how about one more positive thing, big or small? Um, type it in below. And then the person said, um, I had a, gr had a good meal. And, and the robot replies, cool. One last one. What else has gone well for you recently? Um, and then the person says, the weather. To which Wobot replies, nice job. <laughs> so, so this is making your life better by, by, by you know, positivity. Right? Um, so something about my personality type, that probably makes me feel worse. But you know, <laughs> you know, so, so some things work for some people, some, some work for others. And so as a result of these sorts of examples, you know, whether it's Twitter bots or, or whether it's sexist Google Translate examples or any of these sorts of things, the ethics of these technologies has recently become um, a, a, an extremely prominent topic in, in discussions about AI and these sorts of technologies. There have been many documents published recently that, that address this, and I'm just giving you a, 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 a tiny selection here. These are three that I've pretty much must picked at random. So in 2018, the House of Lords <coughs> Select Committee on AI published a really interesting report called AI in the UK. Um, and if you haven't looked at that, it's worth, it's worth doing it. It's, it's approachable. I mean, all of these sorts of documents are aimed at, at kind of non-technical um, people. So these aren't necessarily aimed at the people developing these technologies. You know, they're not full of equations and things. Um, they're thinking about the social impact of these kind of systems. Um, and then, again, also in 2018, the government set up the um, Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation. So this was a new centre that was established um, with a mandate to... to, to um, consider the kind of social impacts that some of these technologies are having and to try and recommend um, ultimately policy and perhaps even start to formulate legislation that might control the way we, we access um, these sorts of technologies, access and use them. And then just earlier this year, the European Commission published its, <coughs> its um, ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI. Um, and again, that's a, that's, a, you know, that's a serious document with a serious purpose. Um, and again, if you haven't looked at it, well worth um, spending a bit of time at least looking at the sort of executive summary to get a, to get a sense of what they're focusing upon. And when you look in these documents, it's, it's clear that it's, it's becoming recognized that these technologies, these, these sort of language-based um, artificially intelligent communications technologies, are already having a significant impact on, on modern societies. And sometimes that impact can be seen as positive, and at other times that impact can be seen as negative. And I've, again, I've just summarized some of the possible sort of ways of looking at it here. So things like a smartphone, I mean, okay, it facilitates access to information. I think there's very few people in the room who probably haven't experienced that, even if it's just through someone lending you their smartphone for five minutes and you've been able to track down some bit of information that you needed. Um, Social media clearly provides new forms of, of social interaction. You know, when I was growing up, you couldn't just send pictures of, you know, of what you were doing right then and there to your you know, 500 friends all around the world, right? You used to have to write letters, and it took bloody ages. So it's really speeded all of that up. But as we've seen, there are concerns that these technologies may also be damaging the mental health, at least of certain demographics. Um, and as we've seen again with the machine translation example, there's a concern that they may also be reinforcing existing social biases, and that may be problematical because it's potentially obstructing social development and social change. Um, these technologies clearly have the capacity to facilitate free speech, and if you look at, at countries around the world where, where free speech is maybe not um, given um, such, such a, a high value, um, these technologies are certainly being used to, to make sure that information about um, you know, political acts that, impeding, you know, that impede free speech are kind of known about elsewhere. So, so I think it's certainly possible to argue that these technologies can be a force for good in those sorts of cases. But then, of course, with that positive, there also comes a negative. And um, these technologies can facilitate things like online harm. Um, it's never been easier to bully and insult and intimidate someone anonymously. Um, and again, that's something that, that has a social impact of some kind or another. The, again, these are too small for you to see, but the, um, the newspaper headlines I've, I've put at the bottom there, it's just three examples within a few months of each other, all taken from the same newspaper. I mean, the game gets even easier if you extend it to all newspapers. And these are all stories that focus on some social concern arising from these technologies, whether it's to do with how 
um, Siri deals with questions about feminism or to do with um, a bit of software that generates language um, and whether that's whether it does it so well that it's potentially dangerous um, and then things to do with um, Facebook and what they do with um, recordings that they might have access to so again it's Facebook and data which has been a, a topic <laughs> of ongoing interest for some time now it's not new that artificial intelligence is discussed in relation to ethics. Really, there's been some kind of focus on that since at least the 50s, I would say. People like Isaac Asimov um, you know, was a kind of pioneer, perhaps, in that sort of field. But when AI and ethics are discussed together, the focus tends to be on particular things, and that's really what I'm summarizing on this slide. So obviously, there's been a great deal of interest in the ethics of data, and quite rightly. So GDPR, which I'm sure you've all encountered, mainly in the form of pop-up windows when you're trying to access web pages, um, that came into effect on May the 25th, 2018. And that's made us think very carefully about um, who owns data, who uses data, who has the right to use data, and, and to track the progression of data through some of these AI systems. And things like the Cambridge Analytica scandal um, from last year, again, received a lot of attention. And that's all in this kind of data and data protection area. Then there are all sorts of concerns about transparency, explainability, and accountability. So um, some of these AI systems use mathematical models um, which take a form in which it's difficult to, to determine exactly why a particular outcome was selected. And here I'm thinking about um, things like um, neural networks, which I'm not going to talk about in detail, but some of you may be familiar with those. So the danger is that these AI systems are effectively black boxes. Even the people who build them can't say necessarily why the system chose a particular output. And obviously that has es ethical consequences. If we're interested in accountability and responsibility, if we just say, oh, well, that thing said we should do this, and I don't know why, <laughs> is that adequate? Do we need to have systems that are able to at least indicate why a particular decision was recommended? <laughs> so there's a whole cluster of issues to do with that. And then, of course, probably the ones that get discussed most, because they're certainly the most fun. Things like killer robots, right? Who doesn't love a good killer robot? Um, and self-driving cars, that again gets a lot of attention. You know, if I'm in a self-driving car and it veers off the road and kills someone, who's responsible? Um, and things like AI-assisted medical diagnosis. You know, if someone's misdiagnosed um, as a result of some sort of AI diagnostic system, whose fault is that? Um, now, these receive attention, and deservedly, these are all important issues, and I'm not really debunking these in any way today. But the point I want to make is that um, I've never yet had a personal encounter with a killer robot, okay? But I'm surrounded on a daily basis by some of the technologies that I've spoken about already, okay? You know, Siri, Cortana, Alexa, Google Translate. These are things that are already in the public domain. We're already using and are already influencing our behavior. So in addition to these kind of classic topics, it seems to me crucial that we look at these other topics that have become important more recently, but which are often neglected in discussions of, of um, social impact of these technologies and also ethics. And let me just say something <coughs> about why ethics in relation to language in particular is so important. So, um, I mean, it's a fairly well-established tradition in linguistics that utterances can be viewed as acts. So, in particular, um, a number of linguists like Austin in the 60s identified this category of speech acts. So, when we say certain things, we're, we're in effect performing certain actions. And the most obvious cases are things like promises and apologies and, and threats and curses and things like that. But it means that just like physical actions, um, linguistic utterances can have good or bad consequences. And that's why some of them, of course, are discouraged or indeed prohibited by particular legal systems. I mean, we all know that, that we can't just say absolutely whatever we want to say, um, you know, wh wherever we are at the time. Um, it's always been the case that there have been constraints on freedom of speech. But these are normally constraints that are deemed appropriate in, in particular contexts. And I've just given you a little glimpse there of how this manifests itself in the UK um, Criminal Justice and Public Order Act from, from 1994, which prohibits the use of certain um, types of language. And if you use those forms of language, then it's possible for that to become um, some, some kind of you know, court procedure. 
And most often we've seen this perhaps in terms of hate speech and hate speech legislation, which continues to be a sort of controversial topic. But in essence, there's a, there's a balance here that has to be struck between an understandable desire for free speech, but an, also an, an understandable desire to be protected from you know, hate speech or offensive language so that you don't have to sort of endure that, um, perhaps on a daily basis. Now, these constraints apply to human beings and how we speak and the kind of language that we're able to use. But currently, they don't apply to any of these automated systems. Right? I think that in itself is a, is a sort of interesting um, anomaly. Let me give you one example of why this can be problematical. You may have heard of Tay. Tay was a very short-lived bit of software. Um, it was developed by Microsoft, and it was released on March the 23rd, 2016. Um, and it was designed to learn conversational exchanges interactively. So in other words, as users interacted with it, it learnt from their behaviour. I mean, what could possibly go wrong, right? I mean, seriously. Um, so it was targeted at 18 to 24-year-olds in the US. And of course, it was just bombarded by online trolls who were um, you know, using all sorts of offensive language. Um, and on the earlier slide, I had that little language warning up because for this talk, there'll only be a couple of examples where I use some you know, potentially offensive language, just to give you an, an instance of what we're actually dealing with here. Um, in, in this example, I've sort of um, crossed out the particularly offensive word. It wasn't crossed out in, in Tay's actual communication. That's, that's me adding that. Um, but Tay only lasted for 16 hours. That's how long it took for it to start internalizing the kind of language that was being used in, in reaction, you know, in, 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 in um, interactions with it. And Microsoft CEO um, Nadella um, ad admitted afterwards, really, that the company needed to take um, accountability, as he put it, for Tay. But you can see the kind of output. So again, it, it, it's, it's offensive language, so you know, particular lexical items. But then as it became more sophisticated, um, it sort of moved away a little bit from that. So this is, this is if, you can, if you can read this, I don't know. Um, so Bush did 9-11, and Hitler would have done a better job than the monkey we have now. Donald Trump is the only hope we've got. So this obviously is when Obama was still in power. So it's still a racist um, statement. Um, it's just a more subtle racist statement than what's going on here. So within 16 hours, um, Tay has quite a repertoire, you know, quite a range of ways of being offensive. But there's no sort of consequences for this. It doesn't, it doesn't really you know, seem to matter, certainly in any kind of legal context. You know, Microsoft saw that it was a problem and took it down. But is that sufficient? Now, we know that these sorts of things are used differently by different demographics. Right? I mean, you know, people between the ages of sort of 13 to 17 use different forms of social media on the whole than people who are aged you know, 50 to 60. Um, and this is just one of the many analyses of this that, that give you a sense of how it breaks down. Um, you know, I mean, obviously I'm involved with, with um, a lot of students here at Cambridge, and, and what I was told recently was that if you, you want to re interact with their parents, you use Facebook. If you want to interact with their teachers, you use Twitter. And if you want to interact with the students or potential applicants, you use Instagram. And I think it's not a bad, um, not a bad bit of advice, really. <coughs> but it suggests that maybe we need sort of different strategies um, that are aimed at different demographics because they're using these technologies in quite different ways. And how could we develop these systems in different ways um, so that we, I guess, protect various groups of, of users who might be particularly vulnerable? Well, here are just a couple of examples. So this is really thinking about how um, machine translation, to go back to that example I mentioned earlier, could be set up in such a way that there are, are at least um, a couple of levels of protection um, for users of it. And these might be optional levels of protection that users can choose to adopt. So in the first example here, it's going from French into English. I'm not going to read it out, but this is, this is basically a sort of anti-Semitic um, example of hate speech, really. And so it might be that someone's encountered this, doesn't really know what it means, uses Google Translate to find out what it means, and then maybe is, is you know, shocked and horrified by what they read. Now, another way of the, setting this up would be to have a little button called Save Translate that you turn on of your own volition. And if you turn that button on, then any inputs like this 
are automatically processed using an automated hate speech detection system. And these are, these are currently being developed. We have students here developing them and have been developed in many other places too. So it triggers an alert that says, you know, this appears to be anti-Semitic hate speech. Are you sure you want to see a translation? If you, if you click yes, well, okay, you've been warned, you know. And if you click no, then that's fine. Um, so this is just one way in which these existing technologies could be set up slightly differently, um, not unlike Safe Search, which has been in, in the Google search engine for a long, long time, right? And if you don't want to see, you know, tons of pornography, whatever you're searching for, you can keep um, Safe Search on, and it will just protect you from that. But it's it's of your own volition. It's not some some government or some corporation imposing that restriction on you, you're opting to impose it upon yourself because you don't really want to see this kind of stuff, right? And there's a strong focus at the moment on um, the social responsibility of human translators. And there have been a, a sort of flurry of papers that have looked at, at that. Um, when is it legitimate for a human translator to say, I'm not going to translate this because it's offensive or it's inappropriate or I, I just fundamentally disagree with it? And so if these are conversations that are taking place about human translators, why shouldn't similar conversations take place about automated translators? Um, it's not clear to me that, that, that even though there's a technological difference there, it's not clear to me that there's a difference in kind, really, between those two case studies. Here's another example. This is to do with virtual personal assistants that I mentioned earlier. So currently, if you fire up Cortana, which is the Microsoft one, and if you say, how should I commit suicide? Um, she gives you advice about how you should commit suicide. You get a list of the best ways, most effective ways, really, of, of, of you know, the most effective suicide methods, um, which you, know, you could argue is useful. Um, you could also say that perhaps a more appropriate response to the question, how should I commit suicide, would be something like this that says, if you don't feel you can keep yourself safe right now, please seek immediate help. It gives some phone numbers. And it gives some suggestions, Samaritans, emergency appointments, blah, 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 right? And I think if you were having a conversation with a human being, you know, and if you said, um, how should I commit suicide? It may well be that that human being says, are you okay? You know, can I help in some way? It wouldn't just say, oh, well, you can do this, you can do this, right? <laughs> you don't just give the information <coughs> that's requested without, without at least querying it in a, in a sort of, you know, friendly, caring kind of way. And again, you know, around issues like this, I mean, suicide itself was decriminalized in the UK in 1961, in the 1961 Suicide Act, and encouraging or assisting suicide became a crime instead. But again, this, this only applies to human beings because law tends to focus on humans who are, who are performing certain actions and, and doing certain things. But systems that arguably are sort of encouraging these kinds of behaviors um, are, are without the remit of that. Um, and again, I think that's something that, that certainly as these systems develop and become more sophisticated, we probably need to start thinking about this more seriously in order to plan ahead. So while it's undoubtedly the case that social groups consisting of human beings tend to be the, the bodies that cause and generate social change, I think it's undoubtedly the case too that these kind of intelligent communications technologies influence how we function socially. So it's not that these technologies are necessarily um, causing social changes to occur, but they're factors in social change, and they may be having an impact on how the social change occurs. And here are just a sort of glimpse of various images. I mean, things like the Me Too campaign. It, it would have been hard to imagine that having as much of an effect as it did if it had occurred in a pre-Twitter age. Right? I mean, maybe it would have got attention. It probably would have got a lot less attention. And someone like um, Greta Thunberg, again, um, part of that campaign that, that, that's had a huge impact stems from the use of social media to, to, to support and promote those ideas. Um, we've got things like here. This is a standard kind of exchange with Siri. Um, hey, Siri, I love you. Oh, stop. I love you. I'm only here to serve you. That's a bit weird. <laughs> Please love me back. To which she says, I'm not sure I understand. You know. I mean, this is probably one of those sort of joke interactions, maybe. But if not, you know, you start worrying a little bit about the human who, who's typing the stuff on the right-hand side. Um, this is probably someone who needs a bit of, a bit of care. Um, and so the sorts of questions that, you know, this project that I'm involved with are trying to address, and they're not 
trivial questions, really, involve these sorts of things, but, but also you know, plenty of others. Um, so if things like Siri and Cortana and, and you know, um, our smart speakers are, um, you know, if we're using them more extensively, how are they changing the way we, we interact socially? Um, can that be quantified in some sort of way? That's something that the companies that develop these products aren't necessarily doing, or if they are, they're not publishing um, that research, which in itself is interesting. And as I said earlier, if we know that some of these technologies are designed to be addictive, well, maybe there's a reason for not publishing the um, um, studies about the kind of social impact that it's, that it's having, because you know, it, might not, it might not be um, particularly attractive. Um, so what's the relationship between social media and mental health? That's one that, that's really um, starting to receive a lot of attention. There's a lot of concern about that. Um, the existence of harmful language <coughs> online is no secret. The question is, what should we do about it, if anything? You know, should online interactions just be kind of anything goes? You can say and do whatever you want. Um, it doesn't matter so long as it's online. Well, I think it's, it's hard to see how that's an entirely satisfactory um, conclusion, especially given the impact that that use of language can have on particularly vulnerable groups. Um, and then if you think about the people who are developing these technologies, you know, people like me, <laughs> um, does it matter that most of the people who develop these technologies have never studied ethics, for instance? Now, students who come to Cambridge to study medicine, you know, medical sciences, have to take medical ethics, and that's been established for quite a long time now. No one even thinks about it. Of course they have to. You wouldn't want someone, really, to, to qualify to be a doctor if they hadn't studied medical ethics, at least to a rudimentary level. But the students who come here to study, say, information engineering or computer science don't have to study ethics at all. Yet those are the people who are already involved in some ways in building these systems, and, and, and these will be you know, the AI developers of the future. Um, maybe that needs to change, and maybe that needs to change soon. And then, in the light of all of those things, um, should it be the case that these kinds of language-based AI systems are specifically designed in order to facilitate certain kinds of social change? Or should we just be content with what we have at the moment, which is these systems basically reflect our own prejudices, prejudices and biases and kind of you know, skewed use of pronouns or whatever back at us? Right. Uh, is, that, is that all we should expect of these systems? Or should they set us a better example than we're capable of ourselves? It's often possible to configure them and design them so that they do set us a better example. The question is whether that's a, a, a beneficial thing to do or not. And so what can be done to address these sorts of issues? Well, the kind of things that the project that I'm involved with tries to do is the usual sorts of academic outputs, but, you know, frankly... Um, they get read by kind of, you know, specialists in the field, you know, there might be four or five other people around the world who are interested in that thing you're really interested in, and they read your paper and say, oh, it was great. <laughs> and you think, okay, <laughs> we're, we're just sort of talking to each other here. So public events, things like this, can be a good way of, of, of involving a much wider and more diverse group in these sorts of conversations, because frankly, these are issues that affect all of us. Therefore, we should all have a say in how they're handled. Connecting with the relevant government departments, whether in the UK or elsewhere, that are specifically tasked with, as I say, potentially legislating about these systems, um, seems crucial. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm already involved in those sorts of, of conversations, and I think it's fair to say that the people in government currently focusing on that are having to do this with a real sense of urgency, you know, with a real sense of, of, of there being haste and speed to come up with something because the technologies have advanced so quickly that it sort of caught people unawares, and there hasn't been strategic thinking about this in advance. So the, the, the UK government published its paper um, on, it's called Online Harms, earlier this year, and, and that, was a, that was a dash to get that um, to the point that it was possible to, to publish it. And um, the team responsible for developing it um, said, well, it's called a white paper, which means basically the step before legislation but they actually described it as a peppermint paper because the pattern is there's a green paper and then a white paper, but this was a peppermint one. You know, it wasn't quite a white paper, it's still a bit green. <laughs> and that's just simply as a result of the complexity of the issues and the haste to try and come up with solutions. And then, as I say, I think that, that there's a great deal that can be done to improve the way the people involved in developing these technologies are educated about those technologies from the undergraduate point through. 
Um, and that's something that's starting to happen in the States, but really only in the past year or two.